Welcome, and thank you for joining our webinar to answer this timely question, crypto and decentralized finance, is this the future? My name is Carol Crawford, and I'm Managing Director for the Americas at CFA Institute. Innovation is transforming our industry with new technologies, reshaping the investment landscape, creating alternatives to traditional banking and finance, including crypto and DeFi. It's early days, but there are crypto exchanges, indices, ETFs, investment trusts, and funds. Cryptocurrency is actually now part of the CFA program curriculum. The CFA Institute's Research Foundation's Guide to Cryptocurrency and Crypto Trading has been downloaded over 40,000 times. And at a, during our recent trust study, um, the report revealed that two-thirds of institutional investors are currently investing in cryptocurrencies. We're also going to be uh, responding to the Fed's comment uh, discussion paper on CBDCs, and later this summer, we're excited to launch our DeFi course. Is this the future? Today, we've brought together crypto subject matter experts to provide some insight. Tom Lee of Fundstrap Strat will pre present eye-opening foundational observations around digital money and drivers behind crypto and DeFi. His remarks will be followed by Q&A facilitated by Rob Langrith, who heads the CFA program. Noelle Ackeson of Genesis will lead a panel discussion with innovators, investors, asset managers, market experts, who will help us understand why investors should learn more about crypto and the outlook for the future. We'll try to touch on a range of topics and please ask questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. You can also upvote a question that resonates with you. In addition, after the webinar, you'll receive a survey. We'd appreciate your feedback on the webinar and the survey will give you an opportunity to shape the topics that we cover with webinars and future learning resources. So let's get started. Our keynote today is Tom Lee, CFA. Tom is founder, managing partner, and head of research at Fundstrat Global Advisors. He is an accomplished Wall Street strategist with over 25 years of experience in equity research and has been top ranked by institutional investor every year since 1998. Prior to co-founding Fundstrat, he saved, served as JP Morgan's chief equity strategist and previously as managing director at Solomon Smith Barney. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Tom. Hi, thank you everybody. And uh, I'm gonna speak for the next uh, 25 minutes or so, giving you uh, an overview of Web 3.0 and why it's more relevant than most of us realize. Uh, but again, as Carol mentioned, it is the earliest days. And that's why I think the cover on this presentation is relevant. This is an AOL commercial from the late 90s. And, uh, you know, back then, no one called it even the internet. It was called dial-up service. So uh, let's start with page five, slide five. And because I think the question in everyone's mind is, you know, uh, if you have spent your career following bonds or derivatives or equities, uh, you may not think crypto is particularly relevant, but uh, it's grown. Um, when we first produced this chart more than six years ago, uh, crypto was not even one full square, which was 200 billion. And as you can see today, it's a $2 trillion market. Uh, it's in not many orders of magnitude away from the size of gold. And it's addressing a market that today is collectively nearly 450 trillion, actually, I'm sorry, closer to $600 trillion today. So as a market, crypto has grown enormously, but it's still a fraction of the total addressable investment market. And if you turn to slide six, uh, you may not care about the size of the market, but you really should care about total return. And as you can see over the last 10 years, Bitcoin is the single best performing asset class, uh, trouncing the NASDAQ 100 with a, I believe it's a close to a 2 million percent return. It's 231% annualized. Um, the NASDAQ managed to do 20% annualized, but you can see that the cumulative compounding effect is, is staggering. So uh, I don't think Bitcoin's gonna appreciate 200% a year, but we believe because of network value, it will still outperform equities. And so slide seven though, uh, kind of gets to the heart of the question that we get from a lot of CFA members, and I'm a CFA uh, charter holder myself, which is, you know, why do we need crypto 
especially since banking works pretty well. And I get this question all the time whenever I do meetings, especially introductory meetings on crypto. And what you have to appreciate is that banking might seem inexpensive if one is wealthy, but it's actually pretty expensive for the average person. Now, this is data from McKinsey, and they show that the average household, head of household spends $2,700 a year on banking services. And you might say, well, I, you know, Tom, that doesn't sound like a lot of money. Well, it is a lot of money. It turns out it's about three and a half weeks worth of pay a year. So the average person in America spends more money or more time working to pay for the right to use the banking than they're paying for their state taxes. So it's quite expensive. And on slide nine, I think the irony is that uh, banking has managed to make more money from customers, even though interest rates have actually fallen for the last 50 years. So as you can see, interest rates have generally fallen. But on the right side, you can see that the financial services industry's share of GDP has actually risen. So it is one of the few industries that has, despite what you think would be spread lending as the primary driver of profits uh, or technology reducing cost or waste, uh, the industry has actually managed to get a bigger share of GDP. And uh, to, again, just to recap on slide 10, banking is roughly 6% of global GDP. It's a pretty huge capture. That's what you would consider the cost of money. Um, and by contrast, in terms of idea, understanding why there could be disruption, you know, when we think of powerful companies, someone might think of social media. And when you look at Facebook, they generate about $37 a year per user compared to banks, which is $2,700. So it should not be a surprise to you that a lot of technology companies, uh, including retailers or digital retailers, believe banking is a pretty big opportunity because for Facebook, that's you know nearly a thousand, a hundred X increase in its addressable market. So uh, let's talk about well, what Web 3.0 is, because um, that's the topic of this webinar. And on slide 12, uh, I don't think I could really tell you what Web 3.0 is. Um, it is really a mishmash and, and possibly a market gimmick, but really what it means is it's really the next generation of the internet. Um, and this does include a lot of terms here, which I've, in, which I've listed, you know, whether it's NFTs, you know, D apps, uh, AI, basically ways to enhance uh, how we use the internet. And on slide 13, if you were to say, well, in a more functional way, what does Web3 possibly do in the financial system? There are really sort of four simple things that I think are being addressed by Web3. One is uh, replacing uh, the cost of trust, because today that's the bulk of why banking is so expensive, is that we are using a trusted intermediary between two parties. And blockchain itself uh, is decentralizing that trust and really dropping the cost enormously. The second is that productivity uh, could increase because of course, if you're not tying up capital associated with trust, you can actually be more productive. So that's a pretty important economic boost. Uh, the third is in simple terms is, you know, optimizing working capital today that uh, people like, for instance, the average S&P company keeps roughly 14% of its cash on its balance sheet. Um, and, and that's really to optimize. So if you can reduce how much capital you have to store, uh, that's, again, improving the productivity of money. And then finally, uh, it's a way to really store value uh, in a way that maybe turning on its head what the idea of capitalism is. So slide uh, 14 are just some examples. I don't want to spend too much time on this because it's not really central to what I'm trying to convey. But if you want to think about what Web 3.0 type entities are, it's really on this slide 14. And it covers everything from stable coins, you know, uh, you know versus the dollar, lending, exchanges, derivatives, even how you access data or how uh, you can have asset managers. And on slide 15, you could see, and this is data from Grayscale Investments, uh, which is part of Digital Currency Group, that the DeFi market today uh, is actually quite big. It's roughly $5 billion of revenue. So it's not something that's still just imaginary. There is true money and revenues being generated. 
So uh, let's jump into this topic, um, which I think comes up, which is, you know, does Web 3.0 exist on its own or is it really an extension of what's happening with FinTech? And I, I would say it's really an extension of what's happening with FinTech. And on slide 17, uh, this is a, a way to really understand how the equity world and financial markets are viewing the financial services sector. There are uh, roughly 11 sectors in the S&P 500, you know, using GICS one level one classification. And this is again, data from McKinsey, but I'm showing you the valuation that's applied to various sectors. So the most expensive sector today uh, in the S&P is big tech, um, whether it's a price to earnings PE ratio or it's book value. And it shows you that the financial markets tend to view technology companies as being highly productive. Therefore, for every dollar uh, of capital raised, they're assigning a pretty big multiple. And I think as you look at industries that have lower multiples, it really reflects two things. Uh, again, I'm stating the obvious because everybody here is a CFA member, but it either reflects industries that don't have high returns, um, so they're not productive because they're consuming capital to actually generate growth, or their future growth prospects uh, are lower than what's perceived as current growth. And slow growers don't necessarily have to have low multiples because we know utilities and staples now actually have pretty attractive multiples and they're growing basically at GDP. And as you can see at the very bottom of this list is the financial services industry. Um, I, I don't know if that makes sense to me that why should the financial service in the industry, which is a huge buyer of technology, you know, at, at JP Morgan, uh, you know, tech spend is one of the primary sources of the company's defensibility. And as you know, today, uh, roughly 40% of tech spend is by the financial services industry, but the industry trades essentially at book value and it trades at a huge discount to every other industry. So I, looking at this as a strategist tells me the financial services industry multiples are low because the market does believe there's a lot of disruption coming. And uh, on slide 18, you can see, again, this is data from McKinsey that companies that are trying to innovate within financial services are enjoying much higher multiples than banks. So uh, at the bottom here are FinTech startups. Uh, that does include what some might view as Web 3.0 companies. And you can see they're trading at huge multiples of book and enormous premiums relative to universal banks. And I think this is the takeaway that even if you don't in your own sensibility think Web3 and crypto and DeFi are important, it's clear that the financial markets are assigning very high multiples to these industries. And, uh, and you know, they've had success. So on slide 19, again, this is from McKinsey, you know, FinTechs are serving 30% of Americans today uh, but they're only generating a fraction of all available revenue. So this to me uh, really indicates that not only are they having success with customers, but their ability to generate more revenues down the road from, per customer actually is high. So again, I think if FinTech is compounding uh, with an addressable market that's gonna grow over the next decade, I think Web 3.0, which is real a key solution to a lot of what's being solved uh, has an even higher roadmap or a ramp. And on slide 20, you might say, well, you know, the reason you don't like DeFi and Bitcoin is because uh, there's so much money laundering. You have to remember that the $100 bill is the biggest uh, source, the, the biggest primary means of exchange in, in every, almost every illegal activity and black market activity. And this is a, an article that was in the New York Times. And you can see that banks, even today, Okay, this is from 2020, still allow suspicious transactions to go through. So banks are, I wouldn't say complicit, but they haven't necessarily done the best job of actually rooting out uh, fraud within the, the existing banking system. And on slide 21, uh, this ties back to something I mentioned earlier, which is, you know, uh, not everybody is uses social media. I don't I'm not a huge user of um, Facebook or Instagram, 
but for those for those who actually use it and use it on their phone, as you know, those companies know a lot about you. Um, the largest single job category for software engineers at Facebook is a monetization engineer. It's over 40% of their engineering team. That person is, is tasked with tracking you, trying to anticipate what you do, and then try to figure out a way to sell and add to you. Um, and in fact, social media companies know more about you than your friends and family. So in a, in, in a strange, perverse way, social media companies probably could make better lending decisions than a bank. And it comes back to this point I made earlier on slide 22 that if you look at uh, banking, you know, the, the US household spends about $2,700 a year uh, to use a bank and Facebook generates about $40 a year from you, 37. I'm just annualizing this the latest quarter. So that's the contrast, right? That Facebook, if they were to turn, try to capture more value because they know so much about you and decide to provide capital to you, they have a hundred times increased opportunity. And that really applies to why Web 3.0 exists. And on slide 23, you might think that crypto isn't secure uh, because it's a public internet or a public chain. And, and you know, crypto is public, but it's also private. Uh, but here's some things to keep in mind. Since in the past 10 years, and that, that's what, those were the 10 years where Bitcoin had almost a 2 million percent return, the Bitcoin blockchain um, has processed about $5 trillion worth of transactions and global banks over 200 trillion. Of which you might be surprised, you know, roughly 3% of all banking transactions are suspicious and uh, actually 6% are actually flagged as suspicious and only 3% turn out to be suspicious. Um, which means that roughly $6 trillion of all global banking activity in that period of time has turned out to be suspicious. And uh, by contrast, uh, first of all, that's more suspicious transactions than Bitcoin's processed in total transactions in the past 10 years. But on the Bitcoin blockchain, there hasn't been a single fraudulent entry entered because of proof of work. So uh, you are really helping root out suspicious transactions, but of course, it's just pushing where the problem is um, to the actual user or you know, identifying users. And then on slide 24, I wanted to address another point, um, which I hear from a lot of clients, which is, well, the problem with crypto, and it, it's actually a fairly correct criticism, is that primarily it's used for speculation uh, in people's minds. Um, and that's because you know Web 3.0 really is still in its earliest days. But it turns out that when you look at Bitcoin specifically, the level of speculation actually is low relative to other asset classes. So on Bitcoin, for instance, if you look at uh, how much speculative trading there's been on Bitcoin, this is from CoinMarketCap, it's about $2 trillion of traded activity. And in the same period of time, the on-chain volume has been about $800 billion. So it's roughly a two and a half uh, times speculation to use ratio. Uh, I was at a conference with Van Eck and they had similar data sets. They inverted the number. They say 30% of the stock is actually um, use versus speculation, but it, it flips to two and a half times. Uh, but you might be surprised that the dollar in that same period of time has had uh, two quadrillion trades, okay, in the spot futures and options market for just $20 trillion of GDP activity. So the dollar is speculated 96 times for every time it's actually used in the economy. So enormously more speculated upon. And then to give you a contrast with commodities, because as you know, Bitcoin is considered a commodity, um, oil is traded on the ICE and CME and hedged and rehedged $80 trillion worth for the $2.6 trillion that it's actually used uh, to produce by refiners to produce gasoline or a distillate, um, which means that com a commodity like oil is traded 31 times on speculation before it's actually bought by a refiner. Uh, so the point is, is that there's actually, it's fair to say there's a lot of speculation in crypto, especially in things like NFTs. But at the end of the day, 
Bitcoin is not speculated enough when you compare it to dollars or commodities. And so uh, I want to kind of wrap up in the last five minutes on a topic that I think is important for perspective, which is that we have to remember that a lot of the innovation that's coming isn't because people who have benefited from the incumbent system see a need for change. Rarely it does because, you know, I've been in equity research for 30 years. I don't feel like it need to change it because, you know, I, I've, I'm used to the system. But we have to remember that that's not who's going to be really driving the economy or financial markets for the next 20 years. It's really millennials. And so on slide 27, I want to highlight something that we have to think about, which is uh, the there is a, an interesting sort of wave of innovation coming because of millennials. This is five-year change of people age 30 to 50 since 1935. Uh, this is part of a bigger presentation we do uh, for our clients. And you can see that uh, we've labeled uh, the demarcations of generations when they hit age 30. And you can see that the boomers were associated with a huge surge in number of people aged 30 to 50. And that started in the 70s. And as you know, that period from 70 to 99 was enormously innovative. And, uh, but Gen X was a small generation. So you can see the number of people aged 30 to 50 actually contracted and didn't inflect until we got to millennials. And that's set to continue actually all the way through 2035. The reason I bring this up is that then we have to think about how millennials are different from baby boomers and Gen X. And survey after survey shows uh, they do have a lot of differences. Uh, for instance, first data, their survey shows that 71% of millennials would rather go to the dentist than listen to what a bank would say. And 33% believe they won't even use a bank in five years. Um, 92, according to a Facebook survey, 92% of millennials don't even trust banks. And uh, you know, the bottom right, there's just some numbers. Millennials are getting quite wealthy. And uh, on slide 29, this is really underscoring the point. Today, the US household wealth is $145 trillion. Uh, it's enormous. America is enormously wealthy, especially for a $22 trillion economy. And according to McKinsey, $37 trillion of that 145 will be inherited over the next 10 years. Um, and according to another study, 68 trillion of that is inherited by millennials over the next 20 years. Well, 68 trillion is a huge number. That's more than the wealth of China. So millennials in the next 20 years are gonna inherit more wealth, net worth, than the entire wealth of China. So if millennials are like, you know, if they like digital assets, uh, I think it's going to have a huge effect on how the financial industry is transformed. And again, I think that's one reason why financial services and multiples are so low. Now you might say, I don't know if millennials really make much difference to me because you might think you know a millennial and you don't think that they uh, may be productive, but that's really uh, a misconception. Because I've listed here all the blue chip companies that we know today, Costco, Home Depot, Bloomberg, United Health, Cisco, Oracle, Apple, Blackstone even. And then I listed the age the, of the founder when, they, when that company was created. They were all created by people in their 30s, some in their 20s. What does that mean? It just means, and I'm just making a point because I've been in this industry for almost 30 years. People... The great companies over the next 20 years are being created by 30 year olds today. And I think if it's very apparent that Web3 is part of that roadmap, and that's why I think it's going to be important to really understand it and, and try to capitalize on it. Um, and then one last slide before I conclude, or actually two, on slide 31, I just want to highlight that uh, millennials are probably also painting a pretty positive picture for the stock market uh, as an aside. So the bottom chart on 31 is the number of people age 30 to 50 rolling since 1935. The top is 10-year total return of the S&P. As you can see, it's pretty much the same chart. And um, 
if history is a roadmap, the S&P could be 19,000 by 2029, by the end of this decade. Um, you know, it's at roughly 4,000 today. So uh, there's a lot of upside for equities. Of course, there's a lot more upside for crypto. And on 32, I'm just going to belabor the point. You need to make generational bets um, in the 80s. Uh, the average baby boomer was 30, uh, 26 and a half, which is, um, and you can see over that next 20 year period, the best performing stocks were consumer stocks because the boomers really innovated retail. And uh, the top seven stocks had 117,000% return. Now, Gen X, which I'm a Gen X in the 90s. You know, we were 26 and a half and we liked the internet. You can see the internet delivered a 1500X return, trouncing the S&P. And now millennials uh, are roughly 30. That's the median age. And what does that mean? I think in the next 20 years, you have to think about what is the big trade. And I, I, I would say a lot of this will be FinTech related. So with that, I'm gonna uh, finish my presentation and I guess open it to Q&A. Great. Uh, thank you, Thomas. So that was a very thought-provoking set of remarks. Uh, I learned a lot uh, through that, so thank you. Um, we have a lot of questions come in, uh, um, but I'm going to go through uh, several of them that have been most highly rated. But uh, just to kick it off, um, so I'm Generation X, um, and I was surprised to learn that the head of households um, spend $2,700 on banking per year. So how are my kids going to avoid that cost? It's a, uh, Rob, that's a great question. And it's a chicken and egg question because I, I would say conceptually with technology, um, the idea of us spending $2,700 a year for the right to actually use fiat money doesn't make sense, but it will never happen overnight because we have to navigate the financial services industry through the web of regulatory KYC, taxation. I mean, the financial industry is literally the other side of the real economy. So for every real econ economic activity, there's a financial transaction recorded. So it's a, it's a big addressable market. Uh, technology and KYC and verification have to improve in safety and then taxation. That's a lot of different asks. I think it's a lot like 1997 when internet retail first started, and it was very difficult for anyone to imagine that people wouldn't go to the store or hang out at the mall all weekend. But as you know, in, in, in just one generation, it is completely flipped. Got it, very good. Uh, memories of the dot-com boom uh, coming back to me there. Um, okay, let's go to the top rank question. And I, I do remember, by the way, early on, you mentioned uh, you, you've struggled to define Web 3.0. Uh, so there's no kind of commonly agreed definition. Uh, so the, the top ranked question uh, really is, uh, what real issues will Web 3.0 solve in the coming future? Yeah, I, it's a great question. And um, there's a lot of things that uh, get solved with Web 3.0. And I, I, slide 12 kind of covers it. And I don't think it's even complete. But I would say, at a high level, what doesn't work well today is things like micropayments. Um, you know, the smallest unit of payment today is, is a penny for the dollar, and it's actually not cheap for us to be sending each other pennies. But imagine a world where, you know, people get rewarded for reputation uh, or for activities. Um, and so financial transactions aren't only presented at a time when you're making a cumulative purchase, but you know, you might want to get paid every day or by the hour. You don't want to get annual bonuses and you might want to pay for your food in a different way. Um, so that is not, you know, today the financial system isn't really geared for that because of the amount of accruals and settlements that would take place, as you know. Um, but already that's taking place in the financial market, right? Like if you trade financial instruments, you can buy fractions of a stock. You know, the average stock is held for 40 seconds. Um, well, money to money already moves very quickly. Physical goods to money happens very slowly. 75% of, well, sorry, in the last 10 years, 50% of all 
GDP growth globally has been native digital. Um, that's financial services, healthcare, et cetera. In the next 20 year increment, I'm sure the number is 75%. That's $30 trillion of incremental GDP activity. Do we want that to be settled uh, next day or overnight? You know, that's what Web3 is going to solve is that in a world that's moving increasingly digital and maybe across borders, you want a system that's actually lower cost. Got it. Very good. Um, okay, so next up, uh, regarding your comments on speculation, that was a brilliant analysis you did, by the way, uh, talking, comparing or benchmarking uh, digital currencies, things like oil and so on. Really enjoyed that. I think it possibly prompted this question. Um, if the level of speculation is low, why does it have so much volatility? It's a great question. Uh, and I can't answer that clearly. But one thing that I had didn't include here, because I didn't want to pick on gold, um, is two things. Uh, number one, when gold first became freely tradable in the 70s after Bretton Woods and, you know, basically the world went off the gold standard, the delivered volatility in gold is similar to Bitcoin today. So when you open up a market and you start to include new owners, uh, there's always gonna be volatility. In fact, gold wasn't held by the public only beginning in 1970, because prior to that, you could buy the gold miners, the gold equities, and they were also volatile. So someone who believes gold is a store of value, it's been an awful source of volatility. And if you look at drawdowns from, from peak, gold has not stored value well because you know gold has gone through multiple regimes of drawdowns of over 50%. So I think that gold as a store of value is going to be, anything that's a store of value is going to be volatile because it's cyclical. The interesting thing is Bitcoin's volatility is arguably could drop in the future because as it as speculation grows, it also has a different addressable user set. You know, today, I know people say there's institutional trading of crypto. I don't, I think people are loosely defining that because no company holds Bitcoin really on their balance sheet. Uh, they actually use it to do remittances, but they don't actually store it on the balance sheet because it really would affect their ability to actually access banking. So uh, I would say it's, just like gold in the early days, it's going to be volatile. Got it. Um, so I'm going to move on to a very topical question. You mentioned use cases of, of digital currencies. Well, here's one use case. Um, so a very popular question is, why is the crypto not, market not acting like a hedge against inflation? Uh, it's, a, it's another very good question. And I would say if someone wants a really perfect hedge against inflation, it already exists. They just have to buy the tips. Uh, as you guys know, the tips in the re current reset is going to deliver you 9% over the next six months. I mean, pretty incredible inflation hedge right there. Uh, but the problem with the tips market is that when, you know, when you're not worried about inflation, it's not a great investment. Um, I, I don't know if it's a central tenet that Bitcoin needs to be a hedge against inflation. I think it's really a hedge against calamity. And uh, another way I would answer it, and again, I, you know, I know there's going to be a lot of eye rolling and a lot of uh, snark, but Bitcoin may not be a good hedge, may not look like a good hedge against inflation right now because we may not really have durable inflation. I know there's CPI inflation. Um, and for anyone who's a client of Fundstrat, we, you know, we've begun to write a series about why we think what we perceive as inflation uh, is really a base, is really base or price adjustments, not inflation. You know, inflation is a sustained rise in prices that's accumulating, right? So something compounding. Uh, I mean, a simple example is, you know, the labor market, total people employed since the end of 2019 is actually down 500,000. There's actually 500,000 fewer people working today. Yet the job market is considered the tightest ever in the history of America. And if you look at the change in employment since the end of 2019, the single biggest category of hiring has been warehouse employees. Uh, Amazon's hired almost a million people since 2019. So uh, 
does Amazon hire a million people because that's how many warehouse workers they need, or is it because of COVID protocols? Uh, retail stores are the second biggest source of hiring. Between the two categories, it's almost 1.7 million people hired. The retail footprint has actually shrunk since 2019. So retail stores fewer exist, but there's actually more people working in retail. I think that really speaks to either it's unproductive, but it's not really, or people had to overhire because of COVID. And if COVID you know, eases, I wonder if inflationary pressures, even in wages, don't look as strong. It's a different topic, but I, it came up in this question. I sure hope you're right. Uh, <laughs> um, so the next question, uncertain, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, we certainly look at different indicators, and um, yeah, that's uh, an ongoing controversy of whether the inflation is transitory or not. Um, great question here, uh, and certainly uh, this had me uh, thinking. Your statement earlier on, uh, when you uh, when I think you you mentioned that zero percent of Bitcoin transactions are suspicious. Uh, certainly, I see some raised eyebrows in the audience here. Um, so what's the, what's the source of, of, that, uh, of that data point, Tom? Oh, sorry, I might have misspoken. On that slide, and this is the slide uh, 23, 0% of the entries on the Bitcoin blockchain have proven uh, to be fraudulent. Gotcha, okay. So what that means is that there's never been a single entry on the Bitcoin blockchain that turns out is not supposed to be there. So that's, now that's actually in the banking industry, they call it suspicious. Like, you know, money moved out of an account, uh, a payment that wasn't authorized. That's never happened on Bitcoin. But the reason is, is that the fraud on Bitcoin happens outside the blockchain. You know, that's when someone's wallet is stolen. Or if they're using the money illegally, uh, that is not what we're capturing. And um, there was... The DEA had a report, it's a little older now, it's from 2019, but 33% of what they believe, 33% uh, of all Bitcoin transactions uh, would qualify as look like they're avoiding taxation in some way. Um, but if you looked at dollars, you know, fiat currency, so not all electronic payments, but dollars, uh, the percentage is actually higher. So the dollar, most of the use of a ben, of a hundred dollar bill, the majority is actually what would be considered a, a suspicious activity. Got it. Very good. Thank um, you for clarifying. Yeah, no problem. I think that was uh, that was that was a, a curveball. Um, so the next uh, next question is a good one. Um, essentially, it's asking. Um, we hear about the the digital dollar. We hear about the digital currency in China and so on and so forth. So if governments create their own digital currencies, can't they protect the public from fraud on those on those digital currencies? Uh, yeah, that's a great point. I think a digital central bank issued digital currency, if it's legal tender, solves a lot of problems. Uh, it's certainly going to make uh, illegal activity a lot harder. Um, you know, in fact, you know, India, of, of course, is trying to move everything electronic and get rid of paper currency. And I think it's Norway. Uh, today in Norway, you don't even have to file a tax return because they've already tracked all your payments. Uh, I think a generation of people are going to be comfortable with that type of uh, structure. Um, many won't because that just means uh, the surveillance of your activity also will be much, much greater. And of course, if it's, a, if it's legal tender you're holding and it's a central bank, currency and the government decides that you've done something, even if you haven't done something and they seize your wealth and your assets, you're kind of stuck. And that we already know that's already happened in Canada. Um, and then I guess the last point I'd make is, uh, you know, the U.S. does risk falling behind because, you know, there could easily be a scenario where, uh, you know, the euro stable coin comes out, it's legal tender, uh, it's guaranteed. And if the U.S. is still working with the banking system to make sure that the banks aren't disintermediated, and we might, just like in wireless, you know, GSM took off globally because the U.S. cellular companies spent all their time fighting over technology. My early first half of my career was as a cellular analyst. So a lot of what I see today in, in crypto and DeFi 
reminds me a lot of the battle that took place in telecommunications. Very interesting. I was a telco analyst as well many years ago. Um, okay, and next one, the perennial question about which coin is better. <laughs> Um, so the question is, uh, is the Ethereum network still the likely foundational framework for the new distributed ledger solutions beyond pure crypto or the other contenders to be watched? The answer is yes. <laughs> Meaning, <laughs> both are true. Uh, it's not a great time for someone to pick winners and losers because, you know, that's like in what people forget is that web 1.0 and web 2.0 companies were all created as contemporaries. You know, uh, MySpace was only created 16 months earlier than Facebook. Uh, Yahoo and Google's inception dates are within 12 months. Um, and imagine if someone said, you know, Yahoo's it's already so big that they're the declared winner. Um, that's a mistake. I think Ethereum has a community and that's really one of the secret sauces to why some blockchains prosper. Uh, but that doesn't mean Solana and others and Avalanche don't solve a lot of problems. Bitcoin has been around for 12 years now, close to 13, and there isn't anything that's replaced Bitcoin. So I, I would say Bitcoin has already become the fang of crypto. Um, so I guess we need to listen to Elon Musk in that case. Um, okay, um, fine, just time for one final quick question. Um, so I think this is coming from uh, someone in the investment realm uh, in terms of prospective investor. They're asking, um, is it more important to focus on blockchain rather than digital currencies for investment purposes? That's another great question. And my answer is, uh, it, they're bringing up something that's important because when we think of crypto, we that most of what we see and people talk about in the Lambos and the moons are all layer one blockchains. You know, they're all, there's Bitcoin and Ethereum, and then there's, you know, dozens and thousands of other things that are essentially versions of a blockchain. And we won't need all of them, but we do need payment rails and, uh, inter, you know, cross chains and things that enable movement of money, whether it's exchange, centralized or decentralized exchanges. Uh, and these are actually, in many cases, companies, you know, funded by equity because they're not actually, you know, they're a native digital service, but they actually have to be funded by uh, people and companies. Uh, so the answer is both. That's why I think in the publicly traded world, listed equity world, there are going to be a lot of crypto companies because they live off the layer one blockchain ecosystem, but they're not, you know, they're not a blockchain. Got it. Thank you very much. I'm sure we'll be revisiting uh, many of these topics uh, in the in the group discussion now. So I want to thank you, Tom, for your your uh, very right. thought provoking remarks. Uh, and now we'll move on to the panel discussion. Um, and I'm delighted to introduce uh, Noel Acheson, who has spent ten years working in capital markets and then over a decade running running e-commerce companies. And then she told me that in 2014 she stumbled into Bitcoin. Um, so she was there uh, quite, a, quite a while ago, which is good. She then joined Coindesk, which I'm sure many of you heard of in 2016. Uh, and until 2021, she ran its research department. Um, so that's a very high profile role. Uh, and right now she's head of market insights at the broker Genesis Trading. Noel, over to you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Tom. At Rob, I appreciate it very much. And uh, thank you all for joining us today. Thanks also to Tom for a characteristically insightful presentation there. Now, um, today uh, we are going to be undertaking a brief foray into the world of crypto assets. I say brief because all of us on this panel could happily talk about crypto assets and their potential applications and the impact for hours and barely scratch the surface. And today we only have about 30 minutes to cover what is arguably the most transformative technology to emerge in recent years. The impacts are already being felt in finance, markets, communication, culture, and more, and we're just getting started. So today we're going to give a brief overview of why crypto asset technology matters, the role of institutional investors, the headwinds, the tailwinds, and other top-down topics 
that we hope will give you a snapshot of where the market is in its evolution and what lies ahead in the short and the medium term. We will leave some time to answer some questions at the end, so please you know, start dropping them in the box. We won't be able to cover everything, this is an increasingly broad topic and, and so much is going on. We have little time. What we do hope to do is interest you enough for you to continue learning about this fascinating sector that, and I think I speak for everyone on this panel, we feel privileged to be able to spend time thinking about. So diving right in, Rob has already given me a really great introduction and I appreciate that very much. So I will pass this over to Sarah, could you please introduce yourself and also share how you got interested in crypto? Oh, sorry, Sarah, before we do that, I do have to say one thing, and that is nothing I say here today is investment advice, and any opinions I express are mine and not those of my employer. But Sarah, could you please introduce yourself and say how you got interested in this industry? Sure. Thank you, Noel, and thank you so much to the CFA Institute for the chance to be here today with all of these Fantastic people. Uh, I am the managing director of the Stevens Center for Innovation and Finance at Wharton, and I also am on faculty and teach financial regulation at Penn Law School. Prior to that, I was deputy assistant secretary for financial institutions at U.S. Treasury. And prior to that, I had a long career in asset management, in portfolio management and trading. Um, I have been interested in financial technology and blockchain since 2013 in asset management uh, led a project on the corporate strategy side related to um, the evolution of asset management and how to generate higher returns over time in an industry where margins were increasingly compressed. So um, that is when I first became interested not only in crypto, but in fintech generally. Um, I published a paper in 2017 on the blockchain ecosystem which I was just flipping through that the other day and uh, thinking about what has changed and what hasn't. Um, and for us at Wharton at the Stevens Center for Innovation and Finance, we continue to be at the forefront of these issues. Uh, we just finished our leading crypto accelerator, launching 10 companies into the Web3 ecosystem. We're launching a digital asset incubator in the fall and um, leading a number of other research projects on stable coins, smart contract standards, and on the regulatory side. Great, thank you very much, Sarah. Jody, over to you, same question. Please introduce yourself and how did you get interested in crypto? Thanks, Noel, and uh, thanks everybody for joining us. I think I followed a little bit of Noel's footsteps here at Coindesk, but um, a little bit about me is I've been in the investment industry for over 25 years with experience across many of the asset classes. And before joining Coindesk Indices as managing director, I was the chief investment strategist at Morgan Stanley Wealth Management, uh, mainly responsible for the institutional portfolios greater than 25 million. And after the pandemic crash, many of our clients were interested in Bitcoin and crypto and asking us a lot about it. So I started to learn more about it. And for me, it was right in my wheelhouse. Um, I used to program video games and casino games in college, and I just became really passionate about the technology. And once I understood the value of the blockchain combined with the cryptography, I thought that uh, it was time we approved it for our institutions to invest in. Um, in particular, we were the first bank to recommend uh, the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust for the high net worth clients. And so I became, again, so passionate about this. I just decided that I needed to spend all my time working in the asset class. And June of last year, I joined Coindesk Indices. That's fantastic. Thanks. Marcos, over to you. Yes. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure being here. Um, I'm a partner focused on blockchain venture capital investing at Aqualit Partners. We're a four and a half billion dollar venture capital fund of funds based in DC uh, with around one billion in blockchain venture capital investing. And now I have a personal and a professional journey into this space. You know, what, what caught my interest from the personal side is I am Greek and in my country, if you recall, there was a big financial crisis. We saw write downs of government bonds, haircuts of deposits in neighboring countries like Cyprus, capital controls, etc. So I started reading about Bitcoin and I realized that we now had a functional distributed system of computers 
maintaining and transferring value without an intermediary on the internet, as we now know. And I thought this was an incredible hedge to the financial system, the traditional financial system as a whole. So that's what caught my interest personally. Professionally, I began the research effort for blockchain um, investing at Cambridge Associates, the large advisory firm back in, in early 2018. And I've been in the space ever since. Excellent. Mikhail, over to you. Yep, thank you very much. And uh, if I do look tired, it's because I'm in Bali right now. It's 1 a.m., but I will definitely not fall asleep. And uh, thank you for allowing me to join. It's a pleasure. Um, my background is I'm the founder and CEO of the digital asset hedge fund ARC36 based in Europe. Um, and uh, my background is that I'm a business analyst, um, used to work with that. Um, and back in 2014, became very interested in, in the concept of a blockchain and Bitcoin. Um, so I guess I came in a little bit more from the technical side, but then got very preoccupied with trading strategies and, and how to optimize both from sort of the, the human and the more algorithmic perspectives. And that then became an online learning community that developed into people asking me and my partners, well, actually, we don't really want to learn how to do it. We just want to give you our money and perhaps you can invest them for us. And, uh, and that, that then, in the end, uh, became what we are now, which is um, one of the first uh, licensed, regulated, uh, actively managed hedge funds for digital assets in, in the European Union. Thanks very much, Mikkel. I am I'm so delighted that we have such a diversity of origin stories as well as backgrounds. And this is very representative of the sheer diversity of talent that is pouring into crypto, the crypto markets. One of the reasons I'm particularly bullish on the outlook. I'll flesh out a little bit about why, how I ended up in this industry. As Rob said, I have been researching crypto since 2014. I was sitting on my parents' sofa in early 2014 in January and watching a video about Bitcoin because I had no idea how it worked. And I got goosebumps when I realized that what we were looking at here was a way to make payments without going through banks, permissionless payments. I grew up in Zambia and just thinking about what permissionless payments, being able to transact would do for individuals and businesses in various parts of the world. Again, goosebumps. And a little bit of uh, background on Genesis Trading. We are the one of the largest digital asset prime brokers in the industry. We're the first and one of the largest OTC spot desks. We are the largest crypto lender, and we are one of the largest crypto derivatives desks. We are part of the DCG family and sister company of, of Coindesk. I get to spend my days trying to figure out what is driving crypto market movements, which is, which is a fun challenge, as well as to identify some of the bigger picture trends that will shape investment strategies for our institutional clients. And this brings us to the topic that I'd like to open with, which is the institutional interest in crypto. This is something that I did not expect. It's not what made me fall in love with the industry, but it is what I have come to realize what is driving the progress as well as giving the crypto industry a very significant degree of protection. But it's not intuitive. It's uh, not necessarily an understandable interest when crypto was created originally to replace the middlemen. Now we are seeing those very middlemen dive in with both feet. So I'd like to open this with the question of you know, why would institutional investors or broad investors more broadly invest some time in learning about crypto assets? Why should they care? Marcus, I'll throw this to you first. Why should institutional investors care about crypto assets? Well, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think for three main reasons, and I mean, there are several others, but I'll, I'll tell you three reasons and a few words on each. So number one, it's the size of the opportunity. We're talking about investors who are looking for investment returns. Number two, the capital and talent flowing into the space. And number three, it's transformational potential as a technology. I think, you know, let's take each one, you know, the size of the opportunity. The way we view it at Accolade is that this is chapter two of the internet. Some people call it chapter three, web, web three, but I'm, I say chapter two because the internet was um, transformed the way we exchange information and maintain information. And we think that blockchain is the next step of that and involves value, not just information, broadly speaking. Now, um, the second uh, 
thing that I mentioned was the capital and talent flowing into the space, which is a prequel to what we're going to see in the future in terms of startups and killer applications. Um, alone, the last year alone, $25 billion were invested into the crypto space from the venture side. This past quarter, just, just this past quarter, $10 billion. Compare that to $3 billion in 2020. All this capital has attracted many entrepreneurs. We see many entrepreneurs from Web2 moving to the space. And it has created a Cambrian explosion in startups. So that's a prequel of what's to come in terms of invest, investment returns. And finally, you know, maybe most importantly, why is it transformational? And I know this is such a broad topic because there's Web3 and there's several types of crypto and blockchain startups, but I'll take DeFi as an example. Um, why, why is it potentially transformational? Uh, Tom touched upon some of these things, but think of the efficiencies with smart contracts, for example, uh, code that continually provides a service near zero overhead. Think of access. Anyone with an internet connection can tap into this global network with a, with a digital wallet anywhere in the world. Think about transparency. Um, these are transparent financial markets because everything is recorded on the blockchain. So, and then, and then maybe most importantly, interoperability, which we, we don't have in the traditional financial system. Anyone can build an app on Ethereum and anyone can build another app on Ethereum that can connect with the other apps. So just imagine the potential of that for innovation in financial markets. Thanks, Marcus. I think you've highlighted on how this industry has something for everyone. I think it's one of the many truly fascinating aspects of it. Jody, which do you think of the, of the reasons that of, of the factors that Marcus mentioned are the most relevant to investors today? Or is there something you think he might have overlooked? Well, Marcos did a great job there. Um, I think just from an investment perspective, maybe I'll hone in from a perspective of meeting portfolio goals. Like this has become quite difficult with all of the stimulus out there. And I think, I mean, the Fed left a lot of room for improvement, but uh, you know, whether investors are looking for something specific like a diversification or yield or inflation protection, or, you know, some type of return where they're looking for an asset to play a specific portfolio role. I think digging deep into the industries of digital assets is important to help them um, reach that goal. And then just on the broader missions, um, one point that I might highlight that I don't know if I heard Marco um, highlight would be how it may influence or even accelerate the adoption of clean energy. So I think that that's you know, one reason that some impact investors may care about crypto. Interesting points. Yeah, the energy aspect is certainly something that many, not just uh, investors, but also regulators are paying uh, closer attention to. And, and Mikkel, a quick question for you. What do you think the main points that investors struggle to understand are? What do you think the hardest part is for investors to get? And what was the hardest part for you to understand when you were starting to learn about this field? Mm, well, if we if we start with the, fir the, the first question, um, what is the hardest part for investors to understand? I mean, I, I would say that what I experience is often the difficulty of understanding the safety and security mechanisms uh, of the space. And how does that, be because it is so technical, because it is based on, on, on blockchain. So that there is a, a lot of a lot of education has already happened over the last couple of years, of course, and especially if we talk about institutional level, then for sure people have the capacity to learn very quickly about these matters and also ensure themselves that the parties they, they work with um, do things diligently. But if we talk about normal high net worth individuals, um, then I often experience uh, and see a lot of of questioning and doubts about the safety mechanisms. And of course, also because the regulatory side is still so unfinished, um, also in the developed countries or, or yeah, both certainly both in, in the US and the EU. I mean, in, in the European Union, we still only have 
for example, if we talk about the fund world, we still only have fully developed framework and, and licenses for limited uh, funds. I mean, AIF LNPs, whereas the full, fully fledged AIF is, is yet to be developed and, and similar such, such issues. I, and I also think that there is a lot of negativity in other countries due to so many scams having been seen um, which sort of cross pollinates with the lack of re regulation and gives the whole segment still to this day a, a bad image. Um, I mean, we've seen Warren Buffett come, come, come across in the last few days with his good old classic remarks that we've seen over the years time and time again. Um, and I would say for, for, for myself, when I initially started in the asset class back in, in 14, I guess my questions weren't that different, but at that time, of course, everything was at a whole whole different level. It, it was mostly crypto nerds, I guess, such as myself, um, that were interested in, in in the technology, maybe more from a technological, and also for some, we mustn't forget, as a political interest uh, in this new, weird, at that time, um, sort of more libertarian approach uh, um, to, to money and funding DeFi that couldn't be controlled um as well at least by governments um so I, I i think you know it depends on on your background some have this sort of technical questioning others have other other motivations yeah to keep it short i think i'll i'll leave it at that that's great thank you and i think you hit the nail on the head with the disconnect that many investors feel when they see the potential but then they have to struggle with the renowned investors such as warren buffett calling it rat poison i think that wasn't the favorite a phrase of his. And Sarah, what did you struggle with mostly? You've been researching this for a long time. What was the hardest part for you to get when you started? And, and what do you think investors are struggling with today? Yeah, I think we've touched on many of the aspects, Noel. I would say, I must confess, I haven't found it hard. I've found it exciting because as someone who's been working in financial services for quite a while, the opportunity to participate in a component of the financial sector where we're really at the forefront of the evolution of how the industry works, how payments will change, how trading will change, and the development of regulation, I find exciting. So um, I, I guess I have a different utility function than others, but um, I think the challenge, uh, as we've mentioned, is that the space is moving really rapidly. And, you know, folks have touched on how it really is affecting all aspects of the financial sector. I would broaden that to say that uh, crypto generally is affecting many different industries. I think we will see um, token launches and investment products and use of digital assets to manage data in other spaces like healthcare or real estate, for example. And Jody mentioned um, the environment. I think that's a major focus as well. In fact, we have worked with a company that's using crypto to manage data for clean energy purposes. Um, I think the regulatory side con continues to be evolving and that's a challenge that many face. Um, as a lawyer myself, I find it interesting to be in a place where we have the opportunity to think about how the law should change potentially to adapt to the world of digital assets. And so I think the struggle for a lot of companies in the space is keeping up with that, making sure that they have good communication, that they're clear on what their obligations are, and that we're um, making available the kind of data that policymakers need to make good choices. I love that focus that you put on the actual use cases, because once you start to understand the potential for use cases, whole fields open up. And we as human beings are notoriously bad at predicting what future technologies, what, sorry, what new technologies will be used for in the future. I mean, just look at what we thought the internet would turn out to be. I think that's one of the most exciting things to look at. It is hard, though, to keep up. I, did, I spend all day, every day, researching what's going on in the crypto markets, and there's still so much that I don't understand, but let's move on now to where we think institutional investors are at today in their thinking around the crypto markets. Jody, what, what's your take on that? Okay. The institutions are definitely interested. Uh, I heard it firsthand while I was at Morgan Stanley. Um, I did recently read a survey by Fidelity saying that eight in 10 institutions 
uh, we're responding that crypto and digital assets have a place in the portfolio. So I think that that's interesting, but institutions are still in their really early days of allocating and they're being led by small institutions, again, like ultra high net worth and family offices. And I think that um, it's, it's still operationally difficult for a lot of the large institutions to invest, which to improve um, at least requires some new infrastructure and regulatory approval. So while there are fun products that in, you know, they intend to track the crypto, uh, many of them have significant fees uh, and possibly limited liquidity. So I think that the ability for large institutional investors to invest may be limited by the development of the custody and counterparty services um, of course, you know, unless the SEC approves a spot Bitcoin ETF, I think that could open up the floodgates. But uh, there's a very high interest, a lot of money waiting on sidelines. And uh, I think that the institutions need to know the rules of the game before they play. And that's especially hard with so many jurisdictions, with global assets that cross boundaries and with new definitions that have to somehow be fit into old buckets. And crypto is helping us to rethink what the word exchange means, what transfer means, even what money means. So I don't envy the regulators at all. It supports what both Mikkel and Sarah hinted at, that it's very difficult. And sure enough, it is adding to the uncertainty of that. And Marcos, is, is there anything else that we haven't mentioned that, that you think investors would be worried about today? So, um... There are several things that the investors are worried about, but I can tell you that from my experience from 2018 to today, it's the difference between night and day. In 2018, when I was starting this effort at Cambridge with, with our team there, there were maybe 10, 12 institutional investors dabbling with minor checks into the space. Um, you know, there was fear about regulation, that this whole industry would go away et cetera, et cetera. I think fast forward to today, um, we have billions of dollars from endowments, foundations, et cetera, et cetera being poured into the space and it's becoming a, a core part of their venture allocation or a, a substantial part of their venture allocation for many institutions. So uh, the headwinds, I mean, they're still the regulatory headwinds but I don't think they are the way they were in 2018 where there was an existential threat uh, that people perceived about the space as a whole. There's the hacking exploits. You know, this is all software, open source software, and there need to be many iterations until, you know, uh, the industry kind of protects um, uh, users around these hacks. Uh, thankfully, it hasn't happened, you know, at a very large scale on, on the major blockchains, but you've seen side chains, et cetera, where there have been hacks, and that's bad for the industry. Um, and I think number, th actually the most important, I think of all the headwinds is the lack of education around this, this technology and the space. The headlines are all about the bad things. Congressmen are, are just, and Congresswomen are just starting to learn about this space. And the general public is just starting to learn about this space. So it's, it's our duty to educate people as much as we can. And that is certainly something the CFA Institute can help with through their crypto yeah. education program. And I've been talking to institutional investors in this space now for many years, and I always ask the funds that I speak to, what do you need? And almost universally, the answer is more education. Even crypto natives will answer the same thing now, more education, because it's changing so fast and there is so much to learn. You hit an interesting point, uh, Marcus, in the when we say we want regulatory clarity, we tend to refer to it as something binary. We either have it or we don't. Without, we overlook the fact that it's actually a gradation and the industry has progressed a lot over the past few years. And let's focus on that for a few, for a few minutes that we have left. Um, Mikkel, you've been in this industry for a long time. What do you think the largest change has been? Let's just choose one because there have been many, but what do you think the most impactful change has been over the past 12 months? Well, if, if I may just uh, give a 15 second reply to, to the institutional side, because I think one, one very important thing that, that, that I'm, is that okay? Of course, please do. Okay, thank you. Uh, so what, what I experience right now when I talk to institutional investors at, at the highest level, 
all over the world is the fact that I'm getting the question all the time right now. Well, if if the correlation between tech stock and crypto is so extremely high, why why venture into this area? Um, and of course they do anyway, but they still want this answered. And 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 what's happening at the moment is just very good in itself because it shows the separate you can say added value of cryptocurrencies over tech stock which right now is developing more positively than tech stock um so that that sort of gives an answer to the correlation side yes there is correlation but there is also more to it when we talk about digital assets and cryptocurrencies um and and that and that increase that difference the differentiate differentiator effect i think will just continue to to grow anyway um sorry back back to your That's a very good point thank you thank you so so back to your your question on on the main developments uh, regulatory uh, wise um the last 12 months there, there have been so many it's actually difficult to for me to just um to just hit one sort of nail uh, and say well that that that's the one and and I actually don't think I want to hit one. Maybe some of the others will will want to do that. But I I think I I will answer a little bit more generically and just say that the fact that we see heads of regulators all over the world literally coming out, taking an interest um, from being very very antagonistic to actually embracing and wanting to to regulate. I think that is a very wonderful thing for our asset class because it brings us from this sort of semi-negative cowboy land uh, reputation to a proper uh, asset class as, as it is and as it should be. Um, and, and I think I'll leave my answer to that. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I mean, the executive order to know that crypto is taking up the time of the highest office in the country that hosts the largest capital markets in the world was really quite astonishing. Jody, what do you think has been the, the most significant change in crypto markets over the past 12 months? Well, that's a hard one to pick one. Uh, I think uh, I'll leave a couple for the other panelists, but uh, I'll say the first US future based Bitcoin ETF that launched. Um, I think that uh, many of you here joining us are well aware of the um, BITO, uh, futures-based Bitcoin ETF. I think it brought uh, a lot of attention to Bitcoin and uh, also more uh, to learn about the differences between the futures markets and the spot markets and even the equities-based ETFs. And I think that just um, BITO as a trading tool um, maybe perhaps more so than an investment has opened the doors uh, for a lot of uh, U.S.-based investors looking for that. But, uh, you know, that said, there are other ETFs listed around the world, spot ETFs. So I think that this just added another tool and I hope for more to come. Love that answer because the innovation in capital markets is it's certainly what I came here to see anyway. Sarah, what do you think was uh, the biggest development, the most impactful development over the past 12 months? Well, I think we've touched on many of the, of the events already, and certainly the executive order was very significant for the industry, uh, galvanizing the federal financial regulators and hopefully setting the stage for international standards setting. One thing that uh, was also very significant has been the use of digital assets in the war on in Ukraine. Um, and I think uh, many of us are probably aware of some of the events there in that tragic, um, in what is tragically taking place in Europe. Um, two days after the war began, uh, Ukraine released the digital wallet addresses for two wallets for uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum to raise money for defensive purposes for the army. And uh, I think more than $100 million of crypto has been raised for defensive use. So that means helmets, packed lunches, medical care. And one thing that I uh, find interesting and really groundbreaking at the same time was that they also passed legislation to regulate digital assets nationally and to designate a national regulator in the space. So not only defining the use of digital assets, gathering data to make better policy decisions, 
um, identify a national regulator, but also to clarify things like tax treatment. Um, so in many ways, I think this has been um, an acceleration of what has happened in the space. And um, certainly um, a model for the world of the use of digital assets and innovation. The last thing I'll mention is NFTs. And that certainly is a space of next generation digital assets that's evolving. Um, Ukraine has launched the Meta Museum to memorialize the war on blockchain. And I think if we're looking for an immutable way to preserve uh, images and memories, it's a very um, important and historic use of the technology. Um, and at the same time, they're selling those NFTs to raise money uh, again for supportive defensive purposes. So I think that's a significant event um, that will continue to evolve. And quite astonishing to see a nation state launch an NFT marketplace. So we had to be a double take. Uh, Marcos, we have about one minute left. Uh, what do you think the most impactful 12 months? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think uh, all the other speakers covered most of the things I would cover, I'd say the, the, the rise of layer ones, of other layer ones outside of Ethereum, if we want to go more towards the technical level, I mean, we saw Solana, Avalanche, we saw a lot of application activity there, which means that the space is growing. Uh, regulation, the Biden executive order, very important landmark, I think, uh, for the industry. We'll have to see how it plays out, but it, but it is a landmark. And I would actually say the explosion of the NFT space from $85 million in trading volume the year before to 20 billion this past year was key. Why? Well, whatever you think of NFTs, you know, they have many applications, but whatever you think of NFTs, what has happened is the consumer has been brought into the crypto space for the first time. Because DeFi so far has been very crypto native and the average person has not been using DeFi. It's mostly the crypto native folks. With NFTs, you now have my mother going in and buying an NFT and you know, my daughter, et cetera. So people are actually now activating wallets and this will then lead them to DeFi and then lead them to this whole ecosystem of, of crypto. So I think that was an important thing in 2021. Totally agree. A fascinating on-ramp, which highlights the diversity of the opportunity in the crypto space. It's not just about trading. It's not just about making money, you know, making money and number going up. It's about the diversity of the opportunity, the, the rewriting of the rules of what assets even are. So isn't that was a fact I could go on so many more questions, so much to talk about with you know such informed and 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 diverse panelists. So thank you very much for that. But keeping on to the schedule, let's dive right into some of the questions. I'm going to just take the top one first, if that's okay. And Sarah, I'd like to, you to take this one, please. The SEC has recently made moves towards the regulation of cryptocurrency. How do you see this playing out? And any thoughts on Ethereum in particular? Sure. So I'll caveat my answer with what you mentioned at the beginning of our webinar, Noel, which is I am not offering legal advice. Um, but what I would say is um, we uh, hosted uh, SEC Chair Gary Gensler at our April 4th conference at Penn Law on the Future of Digital Assets. And it was there that he announced uh, a slightly expanded focus on uh, exchanges that may be trading digital assets that are registered as securities, as well as those that may not be registered. And so certainly this is an area that requires further clarification. Um, when lawyers talk about what's happening in the crypto space, we often mention the Supreme Court case, Howey, uh, which provides the test for whether something is or is not a security. And that test basically says, uh, if there is an investment of money in a collective scheme, uh, with an expectation of profit based on the work of others that the thing may be a security and therefore should be registered or subject to an exemption. At a really high level, what I would say is that I think what the industry needs is clarification. Um, I am a believer that when we have clarification of our laws, um, where additional legislation may be needed, um, once that's provided, I think that there's a better opportunity for responsible innovation. You know, in the meantime, we work with a number of startups at Wharton, and they're sort of running as fast as they can in a space where it's very unclear what will or will not be regulated. And it goes far beyond uh, 
just securities. It goes uh, to you know custodial issues. It goes to the use of digital assets throughout banks, throughout insurance companies, um, infrastructure payments, for example, the development of central bank digital currency. These are all evolving issues in the regulatory space. I think the SEC is one important player in that. I'm glad to see they're focused on it. I think the focus needs to be um, on policy development, not just enforcement, although enforcement is important. And I am a strong believer, and I've advocated for and testified before House Financial Services on the very imperative need for the Financial Stability Oversight Council to convene the federal financial regulators, not just the SEC, but the CFTC, the OCC, the Federal Reserve, and to set standards with international global standard setting bodies. So um, not all uh, policy makers in the crypto space will agree with me on that. Um, but I do think that the way forward is through coordination, starting with the FSOC, which the president did call for. The SEC is an important player of that. And I think it's going to take some time with uh, collaboration with the industry and contributions from academia. I think we can make some good decisions and move forward. You definitely highlighted the how difficult it is to allocate jurisdiction when we are still struggling with what these things even are. They're not necessarily securities, they're not necessarily just payment tokens. It's an entirely new definition of asset, which I think will end up enhancing capital markets regulation around the world. It's just going to take some time because it's very difficult. Another question here I think is intriguing. Jody, I'd like you to take this one. Do you think banks will disappear as crypto and decentralized finance becomes more popular? Uh, no, I don't think banks will disappear. I think they'll evolve. I think that they will start providing services to accommodate their clients and that they will uh, try to work within the new framework. And so, no, I don't think that they will be dying anytime soon. Probably reassuring for many in the audience. Uh, Marcos, here's a very technical one. Let's try and keep it brief, but let's try and give a brief overview of where people can find out more. How would you value a cryptocurrency? DCF, multiples, on-chain, where would you start? That's a great question, and it depends on the crypto asset. So, for example, you know, something like Bitcoin uh, doesn't have cash flows, right? It is um, a form of gold, digital gold. And it all is determined by supply and demand. Supply, we know, is, very, is limited. It's, 21 million. We know it's fixed. The question is, where does demand come from? And demand has been growing there, you know, with ups and downs, but it's growing and growing and growing. The trend line is up upwards because people view it as a hedge, not, not a non-volatile asset. That doesn't mean it's a non-volatile asset, but, but as a hedge to what I said before, the traditional financial system potentially, or, or in certain countries, hyperinflation and other issues. So that is something unique. But think of something else like a, uh, a governance token, for example, in DeFi. In my mind, a governance token is you could do a DCF, right? You could, you could say, you know, how much does the protocol earn in fees if the governance holders of the token activate the, um, the the fees to be distributed, they will get that cash flow. So um, it, it, the answer is it depends on the crypto asset. And that's an important thing that people should know. There, there are many types of crypto assets. It's not just Bitcoin or Ethereum, and it's not just um, you know supply demand necessarily that values them. And the different use cases as well that we have touched on. And that sort of leads nicely into a question I'm going to throw to you, Michael. Would it be more important to focus on blockchain, which I take to mean the underlying technology, rather than Bitcoin or other digital currency, which is mainly the asset for investment purposes? How would you answer a client with that question? Mm. I would say that depends very much on the client's aspirations and wishes. Um, because both can can be fantastic and both can be absolute nightmare investments where you lose all your money. So so again, it, I, I very much uh, like what Marcos uh, just said, and I totally concur with him. Um, fundamental an analysis is is key here, um, and uh, you know even though we do see the so called shit coins. Um, uh, really thunder upwards and then often 
collapse wildly. Um, some have earned good money if they exited early. So again, if if you if you are the right if if you have the right team and you work with the right people, you can earn money on 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 both technologies. But of course, um, me personally, uh, being a little bit more sort of ha having a slightly more technical background, I'm I'm very fascinated by blockchain as a technology, uh, which is sort of the underlying you can say an asset of of what is then built upon it, which is then a number of these different. Uh, Coins, tokens, uh, and other assets that are that are uh, now being formed. Um, so it's you can also see it as a as a two tier model that works conjunctively and and should also be invested in conjunctively. That's a very good answer, which highlights. I love the way you've highlighted the symbiosis between the two. One depends on the other, although they do act sometimes as separate. And it also highlights the difference between something like Bitcoin, which is relatively simple. It is what it is. It has some changes, but otherwise it is what it is. And something like Ethereum, which is undergoing just a staggering amount of change so fast, as well as some of the other layer ones like Solana and uh, Terra, many of the others. And, and Mikkel, I'm going to throw another question to you, which is Riffing on something that you said earlier, you mentioned that some clients don't really understand why they would invest in Bitcoin when it trades like a tech stock. I get this question a lot also, but Bitcoin mm. moves like a risk asset. How can it possibly be a store of value? And this is particularly relevant today since we are going to be hearing more about the U.S. Federal Reserve rate plans in about half an hour. How would you answer that? Let's go into a bit more detail about how you would explain the difference between risk asset thesis and the store of value thesis between Bitcoin mm. and the others. Yeah, I mean, if we if we look at the situation right now where, where Bitcoin is actually doing relatively well, given the macroeconomic and also geopolitical backdrop, um, it, it is showing relative strength to the, the stock market, especially NASDAQ. As, as we all know, it's just had its worst monthly close in, in years. And, and that, is, that is notable because it shows that investors do not treat Bitcoin, at least not only as a tech stock. Maybe it's not exactly yet a, a diversifier, um, but it's clearly doing much better than tech stocks. Um, and also we, we are seeing institutional investors buying spot market Bitcoin, so many, at least that is one of the reasons why it's maintained some levels. So even though crypto funds at the moment have noted outflows, um, we, we still see this, this going long of, of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, and that will be reflected. And I, I know we said not to, to talk too much about pricing and, and sort of be, be too specific on, on that. Um, but I, I find it extremely interesting um, what what we are seeing right now in 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 the sector where the divergence between the two we, we sort of have two paradigms don't we one of bitcoin as a store of value and the other one as a high risk risk on type and those paradigms are obviously sometimes fighting a little bit with each other and and i i and i personally think that the store of value um paradigm is is a very strong paradigm and uh, and as one of the speakers said before yes uh gold has had uh, fluctuation and so so has bitcoin and so will bitcoin continue to have um and 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 that is really one of the fundamental differences between tech stock which has in principle unlimited supply and something like Bitcoin, which has a very, very finite supply and is based on a, a beautiful, well-functioning technology and uh, is most certainly a store of value, digital gold, as, as uh, Marcus said earlier. I totally agree with you. I often get the question, what is Bitcoin when the theory is its store of value, limited supply, et cetera, but it acts like a risk asset? And my answer is, it is what you want it to be. If you want it to be a risk asset, there's your volatility. Dive right in. If you want it to be a store of value, that's a longer term proposition. Stores of value are not supposed to be short term. And we're seeing the on-chain data support that there is accumulation going on. More and more Bitcoin is being held in longer term assets, which shows that Bitcoin really can be 
what you want it to be. You want it to be a payment mechanism, it can be that too. You want it to be a data storage service, it can be that too. So we only have one minute left, and I'm sure that Carol will probably want to say some concluding remarks. I do want to say thank you so much to all of these amazing panelists. I am so sorry that we don't have more time because I could talk to all of you seriously for the rest of the day, but many of you have things to get on with, and I know Mikkel is very much looking forward to ending the very long day that he has <laughs> without no, had no, over there in Bali. No, no. So thank you all so much, thank you. thank you audience for joining us today. I hope you found this informative. I hope that you're going to want to keep on learning more through the CFA and there's also so much information online. Thank you and over to you, Carol. Thank you, Noelle. And we'd like to thank you and our esteemed panel for your insight. Um, to our global audience, Thank you for joining us today for this thought-provoking discussion on crypto. A number of you have asked about the DeFi course, which should be available during uh, towards the end of the summer. And we've also got our guide to cryptocurrencies and crypto trading um, that via the Research Foundation. So please, uh, if you can check on our, the CFA Institute's website, you can find it there. Please look for a survey to follow. We'd appreciate your feedback on the webinar and the survey will give you an opportunity to shape what topics we cover with future webinars and other learning products. Thanks again.